Brown bears are fascinating animals. Adult bears can eat hundreds of pounds of food in a day, and all bears must eat a year's worth of food in fewer than six months to survive winter hibernation. Preparation for hibernation guides much of what bears do in the summer, but not all bears make a living in the same way. Why are there differences in the ways bears look and behave? Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Fitz, and I'm the Reg resident naturalist with explore.org. And joining me today is Ranger Brooklyn White, who works for Katmai National Park in Alaska. We're here to discuss the inherited and acquired traits in brown bears and how those differences reflect uh, the bear's experiences and behaviors. A lot of the things that you can see on the bear cams and also what that might mean for their survival. So we'll be introducing some of the basic uh, differences between inherited and acquired traits and pairing that with information about a few of the bears that we'll see uh, on the bear cams at, at Brooks River. And teachers, uh, be sure to download the curriculum that accompanies this broadcast at explore.org slash, slash education. Look for that link, uh, or look for the link of the uh, Brown Bear lesson plan on that page. Uh, Brooklyn, thanks so much for joining me today. Always great to speak with you. Yes, I'm excited to be here. We uh, got a lot of questions from students, so thank you to everybody who uh, submitted questions in advance for us. But I do have one question for Brooklyn right off the top of the broadcast here. How excited are you for this year's Fat Bear Week? I love Fat Bear Week. It's probably my favorite week of the year. Um, and this year in particular is going to be so special. The bears have been able to get so fat because of just the amount of salmon that we've seen this year in the river. So I think it's gonna be the um, weightiest fat bear week yet. But it's always I think exciting it can be. to absolutely. Um, but it's always exciting to get to celebrate how much work these bears put into um, getting fat. And that's really what Fat Bear Week is all about. Being able to recognize this accomplishment as they are, you know, working to put on those pounds to survive winter hibernation. So Fat Bear Week allows us to, you know, pair bears up against each other and see who will ultimately come out on top. It's kind of set up like a March Madness competition. And so bears will battle and people will get to vote and select the bear that they think is the fattest or that they think has had the most impressive weight gain over the season. And ultimately one bear will emerge on top. I th I'm looking forward to it uh, as well. And uh, Azzy from sixth grade actually asked, what is Fat Bear Week? So Azzy, I hope um, Brooklyn answered your, your question there. But maybe uh, Brooklyn, we need to get into some of the basics of the bears at Brooks River uh, and talk about where the river is, for instance. So can you share uh, with us a little bit about Katmai National Park and Brooks River um, and specifically where, where it is and why do bears come to Brooks River? Absolutely. So Katmai National Park and Preserve is located in southwestern Alaska, towards the top of the Aleutian Arm. Um, it's very remote. It's not accessible by driving there. It's off of the road system. So you have to use a boat or a plane to get there. Um, but the Brooks River is located in a really small part of the overall park. The park is 4.1 million acres. So Brooks River is located in one of the only developed areas in the park that we call Brooks Camp. And the river itself is only a mile and a half long, but it attracts bears there year after year. But there are some very special things about the river that bring bears back. Um, and truly it is because of the amount of salmon that make their way every single year. It has a very healthy run of salmon. Even this year we saw um, almost 800,000 salmon that came through its waters. And of course, because salmon are the bear's primary food source, that's going to bring those bears back year after year. The bears that we have are coastal brown bears. And Mariana from Columbia Elementary was asking about what kind of bears do we see in Katmai National Park? So these bears are the same species as the grizzly bear, but they have a primary difference. These bears have access to coastal food resources like salmon, clams, or mussels. 
So they tend to be more comfortable having other bears in their, in their space bubbles because they don't have to fight as hard over other food sources. Maylene asked from Miranda School, have grizzly or brown bears ever been seen in Katmai? So because we do have the same species, grizzly bears and coastal brown bears, you could say that you've seen a grizzly bear when you've been to Katmai, but they're gonna have just a different temperament. Um, and again, are gonna be more comfortable having other bears around them. Now I did hear a story about a black bear being spotted um, along the coast of Katmai, but it was being chased by another brown bear that was pushing it out of the area. So we don't have black bears um, as a primary mammal that we see in Katmai National Park. Elise from Lakes Elementary was asking about how the bears get to Brooks Falls. Where do they come from? And we know that bears can travel over 50 miles um, to try to get to the Brooks River to fish. Um, we are doing even more research to try and figure out maybe how far these bears actually travel and if they travel over some of the coastal mountains to get to the Brooks River. So we'll see and hopefully learn in the future how hard they work to ultimately get to the Brooks River to fish. Anthony from Columbia Elementary asked how many types of fish the bears eat. Now the primary food source for our bears in Katmai, but specifically at the Brooks River, are sockeye salmon and silver salmon. We see that first run of sockeye typically in July, and that is that primary food source for our bears. Uh, but we do see a smaller run of silver salmon in August and in September. So the bears that are feeding on fish that aren't as spawned out right now are probably going to be those silver salmon. But if you see a bear that has um, a bright red fish with green on its tail and towards its head, um, that's going to be one of the sockeye salmon that is more spawned out. Bears may also grab a rainbow trout or maybe a grayling, but that is not their preferred fish. It doesn't have the same density of fat that a sockeye or a silver salmon are going to have, so it's not going to be as beneficial for them when they're trying to pack on those pounds for hibernation. Thanks for that information, Brooklyn. Um, you know, Brooks River is one of the best places in the world to watch brown bears fishing for salmon. And it's accessible to everybody with an internet connection where we're watching uh, the bear cams on, on explore.org. Uh, but we also got several questions about, um, you know, bears, the, the animals themselves, you know, how do they make a living? Um, a little bit about their, um, their behavior and physiology. Uh, so maybe we can talk a little bit now about some of the basics of, of bears in particular. Uh, bears are mammals, uh, just like us, um, but we had uh, some interesting questions coming in from a few elementary mm -hmm. school students in, in Columbia Elementary, um, all in, in, in second grade. Saul was asking, uh, do bears hold their breath uh, underwater? Can you explain a little bit about why they, um, they wouldn't be able to breathe underwater without holding their breath? Well, bears do not have gills, and that would be the way that they would be able to breathe underwater. So they hold their breath just like people. Um, and most bears don't really enjoy going underwater um, to fish, but some will snorkel and kind of stick their head under the water as they're looking for fish that they could catch. But there are a few special bears that will actually dive um, to the bottom of the river to pick up scraps or pieces of salmon carcasses um, that, especially towards the end of the season, when it's not as easy to catch live fish, they'll be able to go and grab pieces. Um, but most bears don't spend a whole lot of time with their faces underwater um, unless they are looking for a fish to catch. So that's a great question, Saul. And Jasmine uh, was wondering, uh, how do bears stay warm? Ugh, well, I wish I had a built-in fur coat just like bears, especially as fall starts to kick in. Um, but bears have a really dense fur coat. So that's going to help repel water when they are fishing in the Brooks River or in other places and streams and Katmai. Um, but they also have a thick layer of fat um, that's one of the benefits of eating a diet that consists of salmon 
that's so full of that rich fat, and that's going to allow them to put more of that weight on their body. And so having more fat is gonna help them stay warm, especially when they are fishing in the cold waters of rivers or streams in Katmai. And once we get into winter as bears are preparing for hibernation, that's gonna allow um, their bodies to stay warm as well. And then Violet was wondering, what do bears need to live? Well, bears, just like people, require just a few things. Um, they're going to need food. So bears and Katmai are typically eating salmon or berries, potentially other small mammals, um, and then sedge grasses too. And those are all going to provide the bear's primary diet. Bears are also going to need shelter, especially when it comes to hibernation. They're going to need a place where they can stay safe and cozy um, while they are preparing and sleeping through winter. Bears are also going to need um, either bears to play with if they're younger um, or protection. If they are a cub, they'll need a sow to help uh, be there for them. But then as they grow, they are going to learn how to defend themselves. But bears just like people require food and a shelter um, to be able to, to survive. And we, you know, at Brooks River, we're able to see a gathering of bears that's somewhat unique. You know, you don't really see a lot of this uh, happening in other habitats where brown bears live because there's not a very rich concentration of food like the salmon that spawn uh, and migrate through um, Brooks River. So this concentration of bears that we see at Brooks River really does give us the opportunity to explore some of the different ways that they, they look and, and they behave. Um, and Sophia from fifth grade at, at St. Leo School is wondering, what things do we use to find bears and track them? And, and Sophia, bears at Brooks River don't have any tracking collars on them or ear tags, for instance, that would help us to uh, track and identify them. Basically, um, we have to look more closely at the individual bears and identify them based on their inherited and acquired traits. And inherited traits are, you know, those characteristics that are passed from uh, biological parents to their offspring. So if you saw me standing next to my parents, for instance, you would see a lot of similarities. You'd see some similarities in hair color, skin tone, facial features, for instance. And some of those uh, traits are passed on, um, uh, you know, through brown bears uh, as well. So we can, uh, when you look at a mother brown bear and then you see uh, a cub, especially after it grows and becomes separated from its mother, you can sometimes see some of those similarities um, between mother and her offspring. So inherited physical traits are things like ear shape, um, for instance, in brown bears, or the maybe the, the big humps that they have on their back. We'll be talking about this bear later on in the broadcast number 909, but she's a great example of a bear that looks just like her mother. And then this big bear, number 856, um, so he inherited maybe some behavioral traits um, that will help him to survive um, and do so uh, very well. Uh, uh, Brem, uh, uh, who's uh, in New Mexico um, homeschooling, he was wondering how big do the bears get? So when we're talking about inherited physical traits, that's something that um, that brown bears uh, in Katmai National Park have the ability to do. They inherit some pretty good genes that allow them to grow really, really large. And they also have a lot of food that allows them to grow really large. The biggest bear that I've ever seen is this one right here. This is number 747. He is a tank. He's uh, about 1,400 pounds. Uh, so he's a real giant of a, of a brown bear. And not all bears in Katmai get as big as him, um, but many of the fully grown adult males uh, that we see at Brooks River are going to weigh over a thousand pounds at the end of September and early October. So really, really big uh, mass of animals. So they have these inherited physical traits. Um, so some of those ear shapes that we can see, body size that we can see, but they also have inherited uh, behavioral traits as well. And this includes things like instincts um, that would allow them to find food and also survive times when they don't have food, such as hibernation, for instance. We did get actually several questions about uh, or related to hibernation. Uh, Cole from uh, Qu Quail Hollow Elementary asked, what do bears do when they hibernate? And do they sleep the entire time? Uh, so when bears are hibernating, really what they're doing is they're, they're saving energy 
conserving energy as much as possible so they can survive without food and water. When they're in the den, bears, what they're doing is mostly just resting. Their metabolism, their energy expenditures is much reduced compared to the summertime. And they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't even pee or poop. So really what they're doing in the, uh, in the den is just resting um, and, and saving their energy as much as possible to try to get through the time period in the wintertime when there's very little food available to them. And they do sleep um, you know, most of, of that time, but they uh, can get up and they can be active um, during the winter if necessary. So they can, stay, they can still stand up even though they are uh, technically in a hibernation mode. They can still walk around even though they are in a hibernation mode. Uh, and related to hibernation as well, one of these um, inherited behavioral traits, uh, 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 Combrey from fourth grade in Carver Elementary was asking, how will, you know, uh, how does a bear know what time it is and when it's close uh, to a time to go into hibernation? You know, each, each day we kind of feel a little uh, tired and sleepy at the end of the day and bears feel those same things as well. So at nighttime, they tend to be a little less active than us um, in Katmai National Park, so uh, or compared to us in Katmai. So they um, will still sleep at night just like us. Um, but it seems like towards the end of the summer, their bodies um, are triggered to shift into a more of a hibernative mode. And I think that's dependent on the amount of daylight that they're experiencing. So in late summer, when we have uh, the nights start to grow longer and days become shorter, um, then that triggers some internal changes in uh, inside of bears that helps them to know it's close to hibernation time. When they're inside of the den though, they're really not experiencing a lot of daylight. A lot of their dens are covered over by a thick layer of snow uh, in the winter time. So they also have um, just a, a cycle that's uh, regulated by their brain and their bodies that helps to tell them about what time of the year it happens to be. So they know when it's appropriate for them to start to wake up and get out of their dens. So they have um, you know, the, a lot of uh, external cues that they can that, that trigger when they go into hibernation and also some internal cues that can tell them when it's a good time to exit uh, the den. And those are a few things about inherited traits in bears. But Brooklyn, I think you have um, some information to share with us about acquired traits, those things that bears learn or get over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so bears just like people are going to change in appearance a little bit as they grow. Um, Bears could gain scars just like people. They could gain weight or lose weight, and those are going to change their physical appearance. They're still going to be the same bear, but they are going to have new things that help us identify them or recognize them based on what experiences they are having while they're on the river, just like people. Acquired behavioral traits are going to be things like learning fishing techniques, or um, how to handle themselves on the river, um, whether that's if they're going to be a dominant bear or a more submissive bear. These are all things that they are going to learn to be able to um, do well and make a living um, and ultimately pack on those pounds for winter. So Brayden from Carver Elementary asked how the bears learn to catch salmon. So bears are going to learn by seeing and by doing. As cubs, bears are going to be watching their mother catch salmon. They're going to see her fishing styles, if she uses the lower river, if she maybe is a snorkeler or she dives under the water to get fish, um, or maybe they're even going to see their mother utilizing the falls like the bears that we just saw in that clip. They then will begin to learn how to fish for themselves alongside their mother. Um, as they get older, they will begin catching salmon on their own or picking up scraps of salmon um, along the river. And then once a cub has been emancipated or kicked out by their mother, it becomes that bear's sole job to figure out how do I catch salmon on my own. So bears will typically start with a dash and grab technique. Um, they're going to see a salmon and they're going to run after it because that's what makes the most sense. I see the thing I want and I'm going to go try to get it. It's not the easiest way to catch a fish, but as young bears, they may not have the opportunity to use some of those better fishing spots, those prime fishing spots that bears that are a little bit older or more dominant may have the opportunity to use. But the bear, the longer a bear works at fishing, um, the better they're going to get. 
practice is going to make perfect. But there are some bears that have some natural giftings um, as they've watched their, their, their mother use specific techniques, especially um, fishing the lip, they may show that they um, are a little bit better at doing that than others. It's still not going to be an easy job, but they may have a leg up on the competition. Liesl, who is a homeschool student, asked how much salmon do bears eat? So they're using these fishing techniques and now we wanna see how well are they doing? Uh, and some bears can eat over 40 salmon a day. Right now, bears are fishing nonstop in preparation for hibernation. This is called hyperphagia. So we've entered this phase where bears are no longer eating because they are hungry, but they're still gonna be hungry and trying to suppress those um, feelings. But now their bodies have stopped telling them that they're full. So normally when we're eating a meal, at some point we go, oh, I do not need to eat anymore. I've eaten too much. But right now, bears' bodies are not saying that. They're saying, keep eating. So bears are gonna be eating as much as they can, um, all in preparation to try and get as much fat on their bodies for winter. So bears are going to be eating sam 40 salmon or more um, as they prep and try to get ready. But all of this is going on to prepare um, and ultimately we'll get to celebrate this preparation through Fat Bear Week. So we've got some of the contenders for Fat Bear Week that we're gonna talk about and some of these inherited and learned traits to these specific bears. So one of the first bears we're gonna chat about is 128 Grazer. Yeah, she's a great bear to talk about. One of my favorite bears to watch at Brooks River. Uh, one of her inherited traits um, that I see in her is her big blonde ears. Um, she's, uh, Grazer's a bear whose mother and aunt also had large blonde ears. Grazer's also a, a defensive mother bear and bears have different personalities and tolerances for one another. Uh, and Grazer's mom uh, was noted to be somewhat defensive uh, as well. So perhaps Grazer inherited a little bit of her mother's defensive characteristics. So those are a couple yeah. of those inherited traits that I uh, notice in her. Uh, talking about the learned or acquired traits in Grazer, I think um, she's one of the most skilled bears fishing uh, the lip of Brooks Falls. And she was introduced to Brooks River by her mother, but her mother didn't fish the, the lip of the falls. So again, the lip is the top of the falls where the bears stand and they can wait for the salmon to jump towards them and they catch the fish in their mouths. Uh, and her mother, um, from what I saw, didn't do that. So when Grazer was a cub, they fished in different areas of, of Brooks River. So while many bears utilize fishing techniques that their mothers also used, uh, bears also have the ability to learn by watching others and trying new things. Um, and that's an important way that they, they gain experience and they gain skills. And that's likely how Grazer uh, was able to fish uh, the lip of the falls. Right now, Brooklyn, though, there's one um, small bear on the cameras that we've been seeing, especially at the river mouth on the lower river cameras. We've been seeing quite a lot, and that happens to be Holly's cub. Um, what can, what can um, you tell us a little bit about, uh, about her cub and some of those behavioral uh, traits that we can see in them? Yes, well, right off the bat, we can see this cub has um, some light coloration, and that is a classic 435 Holly. Um, she's always been a very light colored bear. So we're able to see some of that and we'll see if this bear continues to have that light coat or if ultimately they grow into a darker coat. Um, Holly has always had um, a tendency for her cubs to have lighter coats, though in her last litter, she had one that was very blonde and one that was very dark. So we'll see what this bear ultimately carries with it. Um, but we also see this bear learning to be incredibly independent and brave. That's another trait that many of Holly's cubs have portrayed in the past, um, an independence and a fearlessness. Even when um, battling a porcupine, like this cub did at some and ultimately received um, quite a few quills in the paw. Um, and not being afraid to try to introduce themselves to other bears. Even this season we saw uh, this cub playing with other cubs, trying to play with sub-adults, um, and relatively fearless having um, its sow behind it. So 
we've definitely been able to see um, this independence and confidence that's been instilled by um, and learned from 435 Holly. So Besa from Miranda School asked, why do spring cubs or first year cubs have dark fur and it gets lighter as they get to be an older cub, then darkens again as they become a subadult? So it's interesting to see, but bears are going to have coats that are all different shades. So some bears are ultimately going to have a dark coat all throughout their lives. Some bears are going to start with that dark coat that they have as a spring cub and then um, transition into having a lighter coat. And seasonally, we will also see bear coats change. Typically bears are going to emerge from their dens with a lighter coat. And then as winter comes, their coats are going to darken. But it really just depends on the, the physical traits that those bears are carrying from, from their parent bears. And then Laura from St. Leo's School um, asked, where does Holly hang out the most? So as we've been able to see on the cams this season, um, she has spent a lot of time um, in the lower river and on the beach. So that's where she and her cub have spent the most amount of time. Um, it's easier for her to fish down there, especially with her cub, not having to worry about other larger bears potentially posing a threat to her cub. And so that's kind of been her primary spot, hanging out there. Um, and then she has traveled a little bit to other spots in the park, but come back and has now positioned herself as the queen of the lower river. Another bear that we um, find to be a really interesting story is 151 and seeing his kind of um, up and coming nature on the river. Yes, 151 Walker is um, another great bear um, to, to watch. He um, is a bear that was also introduced to Brooks River by his mother. Uh, and when I look at him and I'm looking for some of those acquired or learned traits in uh, Walker, I see like um, like Grazer before that fishing the lip of the falls and the, and the far side of Brooks Falls was not something that his mother did, but that's definitely something that 151 Walker does. So he's learned over time to uh, fish those locations, even though his mother wasn't able to compete for those fishing spots. Inherited traits in Walker though, uh, that I see um, compared to his, uh, his mother, and we don't, his mother no longer visits the river. We don't know what happened to her, uh, but uh, he, Walker has a very conical shaped face. So it really kind of narrows and tapers um, like a cone. So he's a very sort of narrow muzzle, kind of a skinny muzzle. And that's similar to his mother. And while this photo right here is a late summer photo of Walker, in early summer, his fur color is much lighter brown. And that's also very similar to his mother. Walker has um, some behavioral traits that are, that are somewhat interesting um, to take a look at. Uh, and a few, a few questions related to those that got submitted. We, uh, Yaroslav was wondering, um, and he's from fifth grade Miranda school, how rare is it that a bear attacks another bear? Um, and we see, we've been seeing Walker being more willing recently to actually sort of stand up and um, and try to uh, you know acquire those uh, those good fishing spots at Brooks Falls. When he was a younger bear, he was much more likely just to sort of like say, "Hey, I don't want to try this. Uh, it seems like it's uh, going to be a bit difficult, and I don't want to get in a fight. I'm just going to keep my distance." But now, since he's a real big guy. It seems like he's more likely to stand his ground and acquire those more preferred fishing spots. But it's also not likely that bears are going to uh, get into fights uh, because bears really want to avoid physical conflict as much as possible. They want to avoid fights because there's a risk um, to both bears if they end up getting in a fight. So they could get, uh, both of them could get severely injured. So they usually use um, a variety of po body postures, um, head positions, ear positions, um, vocalizations to communicate which bear is more dominant and which one is subordinate, which one should yield space. And that's, uh, we're seeing Walker showing more of those characteristics of a dominant bear, directly approaching other bears, for instance, and telling them to get out of the way just because he's a real big guy and you need to leave him uh, some, some space. Uh, but Walker was a, um, a more tolerant bear of other bears when he was younger. Um, Emma from third grade at Lakes Elementary was asking, are all these bears friendly? And sometimes yes, and, and a lot of times no. Um, it depends, I think, a lot on how well fed they are. Uh, but the bears, uh, 
definitely can change their personalities over time. And we definitely see that with Walker. He was a much more tolerant bear when he was younger. He loved to play with other bears when he was younger. And we don't really see him doing that very much uh, right now. So a lot of times younger bears can be more friendly with other bears and seek out playful opportunities and want to play fight or spar with other bears. But we often don't see that with the older adult males like, um, like 151 Walker. Uh, and Arian uh, was asking, uh, and he's in fifth grade, you know, when, when males go to the falls, why don't they attack each other for their food? Well, it's, it's because, you know, they, they want to avoid conflict. They want to avoid getting um, injured. And, and they can do that through their system of communication. So it's not, uh, bears live in a very competitive world and they compete for fishing spots um, access to food resources, ask, access to mating opportunities, but they don't always, uh, rarely need to fight for access to those resources that they need to survive. So again, they're using their ability to communicate with one another and settle their disputes without having to um, resort to a fight. So um, when you're watching the cameras, look for that. Look for one bear to approach another, but look for those bears mostly to settle their disputes without having to fight one another because they can read each other's body language just like we can maybe without necessarily having to speak uh, to, to one another. One more bear though um, that we wanna talk about Brooklyn is a, another fun bear to watch, a young bear that was raised along Brooks River. Um, and that happens to be um, number uh, 909. Yes, and 909 is a perfect example of just these inherited physical traits. We're able to see those same very fluffy blonde ears that um, her mother, 409B nose had, um, and then even a similar face shape to, to that sow. Um, in all actuality, she looks almost like um, a mini me of, of her mother. So she's inherited a lot of those same physical traits. Um, when we're looking at learned behaviors, we are able to see her ability to utilize um, the, the lip of the falls. And her mom was classically a lip fisher, actually one of the most um, well-known and easily identifiable, easily identifiable, identifiable bears to utilize the lip. Um, even, you know, people taking pictures, uh, most likely the bear that was seen on the lip of the falls was in fact 409. But just because her mom was able to fish the lip well, does not mean that she was going to be able to do that. Just like when we are toddlers and we can see our parents walking, we still have to learn how to walk ourselves. So 909 has been learning to fish the lip and is often seen there um, and she's getting really good. So she was, she was able to learn that behavior from her and her mom, but has now been able to really take that upon herself. And it's now becoming not only her mom's legacy, but hers as well. And then Audrey from Lakeside Elementary asked, why are the bear's ears so much lighter in color? So just like I was saying about 909, um, this is one of those traits that's gonna be passed down. And some bears are going to have lighter colored ears while other bears are not. Um, we were able to see 909's ears as well as 128 Grazer's ears as well um, are going to ha have that light fluffy look to them. Um, but there are other bears that don't have that same kind of real fluffy, light colored ear. So it's just another one of those traits that we may be able to see um, inherited from generations of bears. And those are a few of our Fat Bear Week bears, and you can vote on those bears starting on September 30th this year. Uh, so it's it'll be i think a wonderful competition for everyone to um to decide who they think is uh, the fattest bear of of 2020 which one gained um, the most weight or gained weight most impressively based on their body size or other life history characteristics so i'm looking forward to seeing how everyone votes uh this year and we have uh, brooklyn several more quite or actually many more questions to try to get through uh, but just to try to wrap up our um, main part of our conversation today uh, I wanted to say that the brown bears at Brooks River really do show us uh, that there's more than one way to make a living. Uh, you know, many of the physical traits that we see in these bears are inherited, uh, but a bear's acquired uh, traits like their fishing techniques are also uh, an extremely important component of their, their overall survival. 
And each bear that we see at Brooks River is a unique individual, just as you, you know, as unique as you and I and any of our pets that we might have living with us. So a bear's combination of acquired and inherited traits uh, provides it with the tools and skills necessary to survive in a very tough and competitive environment. So thanks for um, you know, sub, uh, everyone who has submitted their questions. Um, we know that we couldn't fit all of our, your questions into our, um, the main part of our conversation today, but we're gonna, Brooklyn and I are gonna try to get through uh, many of the rest of the, the questions during the next several um, minutes. So if you can stick with us, that would be uh, just wonderful. Uh, but uh, some of the, we actually had three questions about birds, Brooklyn. Uh, somebody, uh, several different students were wondering about those. You wanna take us through uh, a few of those questions? Absolutely. So Ellie from Fernhill Academy asked, do the bears ever eat the seagulls? So the birds that we have primarily seen on the cams are a type of gull, but they're not seagulls because we're not on the ocean. Um, but I have never seen a bear eat a gull, um, but I think it's because they have access to a very um, you know, easily accessible resource in the salmon. They know how to fish for the salmon. There are a lot around them. So they're not having to fight as hard or compete over the birds. I think the birds would be a little bit harder to get. Cameron from Lakes Elementary asked that same thing. Why don't the bears eat the birds? As well as Noah from St. Leo. Um, so again, the birds are not their primary food source. It's not something that's gonna give them a whole lot of calories. And I sure wouldn't know how to try and catch one of these gulls. And I don't think the bears know either. The, the bears uh, are, are quick animals, but they're not as quick as a gull. So I think it's, um, the bears know that. They're like, yeah, it's probably just not worth it. There's a lot of easier meals available uh, to yeah. them. One question um, that I missed um, earlier in our chat, I wanted to get to it earlier, but I, um, I, I missed it accidentally. Um, was about cubs and when, when do bears have cubs? And that was asked by Theon, um, a sophomore at Central High School. Uh, so bears uh, have cubs in, um, in the middle of winter while they're actually hibernating. And they're the only mammal that can give birth and nurse their young while, uh, while hibernating. It's a pretty remarkable thing. So when we look at some of the adult females at Brooks River, like uh, Grazer, for instance, um, or many of the other um, single adult females that are walking around, um, you know, they're, uh, there's, the single adult females that we see at Brooks River are um, eating not only to support their own survival in the winter, but they could be getting ready to give birth this winter. Generally around the end of January and early February is when bear cubs are born. And their uh, mothers are gonna give birth without, again, without eating or drinking. So that those uh, fat reserves that they gain during the summertime are ex uh, especially important to help support the birth of their cubs during the winter. Uh, Giovanni from second grade in Columbia Elementary was wondering why uh, don't the bears uh, fall when the when the water rushes past them, uh, and that's a good question because it's you know the, the the water at the falls is very strong. The rocks are very slippery. I've been in the water at Brooks Falls at a time of the year. I should clarify. I should say for sure when there aren't bears around. I'm not going to go into the water when there are bears around. That would be that would be <laughs> foolish, of course. So I, I, I don't do that, but I kind of explore the area when, um, when there aren't bears around. And the water is, um, is swift, it's strong, the rocks are slippery, so it can be hard for me as a two-legged creature to walk through the water there. But bears, you have to remember, are much bigger than the average person, so they have a lot more body weight to hold them down. And they also have four really big paws that are really the size of dinner plates. Um, so they're kind of locked in with four-wheel drive and they're able to navigate the waters around the falls much easier than a human would due to their size and their strength and the four paws that they can place on the ground at, at the same time. So Eager from Carver School in fifth grade asked, were the two big bears playing or fighting? And it's possible that either were happening. Um, we will typically be able to know that bears are fighting because it is loud. It's very loud and it's definitely not playful. Um, typically you're going to see bears that are very aggressive when they are fighting. When bears are playing, it's typically a lot quieter. You're not hearing the same kind of vocalizations. And um, the bears kind of let each other take turns. Um, sometimes it's them practicing how to establish dominance. 
sometimes it truly is trying to get out some of that energy. Um, so typically we are able to identify if a bear is playing or fighting, but sometimes it looks very similar because oftentimes it really is just preparation for um, the future and what they'll need to do if they ever try to challenge another bear that's in a more dominant position. And Carter uh, from Columbia Elementary asked, where do bears sleep? And they sleep pretty much anywhere that they feel comfortable. Uh, so it depends on your comfort level. If, you, if you're a bear, it depends on your comfort level around other bears. Uh, and the the, maybe the weather conditions, for instance, if it's very stormy, they, then they might go into areas where um, they can find um, some cover to protect them from the storm. But often they don't. Sometimes they'll sleep out in the open, open even though it may be cold um, and, and raining. Sometimes bears will even sleep right in the middle of the river. They'll just find a place where they can put their head on a rock or on a tuft of grass. We've been seeing that with, um, with certain bears at Brooks River this fall. Uh, so it, it, they'll sleep wherever they happen to feel comfortable. They don't necessarily need to go to a specific spot each and every day. It just happens to be where, um, where they're comfortable and where they can stay warm enough. And for some bears are large enough, they can lay right in the water and even take a nap there. So Kendall from Lakes Elementary, oh, no, Enrique from Columbia Elementary asked, how long are bear claws? So bear claws can be four to five inches long, um, sometimes even longer, depending on the bear. And they grow like fingernails. So our fingernails grow. And if we don't cut them, they grow longer and longer. So bear's nails are going to grow. And as they age, they're slowly going to um, wear down. So the bear's nails are not going to be as long. Their claws are not going to be as long as they were um, as their claws were growing. Um, but they could be four to five inches. So that's still a hefty, a hefty claw. This is a, yeah, an image of some bear claws right here. <laughs> yeah, this is the front front paw of a uh, of a of a brown bear. Their claws on the front are very, much longer than the ones on the back. But yeah, several inches long. They're they're great tools at digging and uh, and grasping things. So wonderful, wonderful tools for bears. Kendall from third grade, uh, Lakes Elementary was wondering, uh, do male or female bears do more of the hunting? And it's probably about equal uh, for, for most bears. Uh, only, mother, uh, only mother bears raise cubs. So uh, male brown bears don't have any role in raising cubs. It's only the, um, the females that raise cubs. So a male bear will go and he'll hunt, he'll fish, he'll gather food as much as possible for himself. And a mother bear has to do that for her own, for herself, but also her cubs. So it seems to be distributed a bit e equally, I think, between male and female bears. It's really hard to tell which one uh, does more hunting. I think it probably is about average. Aiden from Columbia Elementary asked, what do bears eat if they can't fish? So bears, when they first emerge from the den, are typically going to be eating grasses, sometimes bark. Um, or over-seasoned berries, so berries that have gone through the winter um, and were not eaten before bears were able to go into their dens. Then once bears have gotten to the streams, um, if they aren't eating salmon, they may be finding small mammals like arctic ground squirrels, um, but then one of their primary food sources is going to be berries. So um, in late summer or early fall, they're going to start eating um, high bush cranberries or blueberries, watermelon berries. Um, they're going to be finding all sorts of berries that they're able to um, supplement their diet with. And Jay from Lakes Elementary was wondering, how do the, the workers or rangers clean the Brooks Falls area to make sure it's safe for bears? And actually, uh, rangers don't do really anything to um, prepare the area for the bears. They're all, they're wild animals. So they have to survive using their own instincts, um, their, their skills, um, and some of the learned um, acquire, uh, you know, traits that they gain through their experiences uh, in their lives. And it can be very difficult for them. So they live, in a, again, in a very competitive and, and tough environment. Uh, but um, in national parks, national parks protect um, not only certain species of animals, but also the processes 
that support um, those species as well. And generally, nothing is done in national parks to help um, individual animals in, a, in certain locations. So this question goes really well with that. Audrey from Lakes Elementary um, asked if the bears ever get fed by workers if they're not eating enough fish. So just like you mentioned about um, not cleaning up habitats, um, the rangers are not going to be supplementing the diets of bears. The bears um, are following those natural processes. And so they're going to be responsible for feeding themselves, for finding the food that they need, and rangers are not gonna be interfering. Um, the only time that um, park rangers may interfere is if there is a, a human caused something. So if there are, um, you know, trash that is accumulating, rangers are going to be picking that up so bears are not going to be eating it. Or um, if there was some sort of human caused injury to a bear, um, rangers then might intervene to do something. But otherwise, we are letting the bears do uh, what they do um, to try to keep them as wild as possible. And Parab from uh, Miranda School asked, what happens if a bear doesn't eat enough and hibernates? What's well, going to have a harder time, uh, you know, surviving if it doesn't have enough fat reserves? Fat really is the fuel that helps bears survive winter hibernation. They rely on their body fat more than any other tissue or any other substance when they're inside of, of their dens. So if a bear doesn't have enough fat reserves when it goes into their into its den, it may have to start to draw energy from its muscle tissue. Um, and that's gonna make it maybe weaker when it comes out of the den. So it's really important for bears to eat enough food in late summer and early fall so they have enough fat reserves um, to sustain them through that hibernation time. So Isley from Carver Elementary asked the question that we kind of answered earlier from Giovanni. Um, but asked, the water is flowing very fast. How do the bears stay in one place without moving? Um, so like you know, Mike said earlier, um, they have so much weight because they are a four-legged creature that stands on all four legs. So they're gonna have a stronger posture than us trying to stand on two legs. Um, I have also walked in the Brooks River when bears were not there um, and I, fell over a couple times and actually filled my waders with water, which made it even harder to walk. Um, so I think that the bears have really got it figured out because I did not do very well trying to walk on my own. There are many people I think that share that same experience, uh, Brooklyn, so we're not, you're not the only one uh, who's, who's had it. Um, just a couple more questions that we'll try to get to um, before we conclude our broadcast uh, today. Uh, ben, who's actually a senior at Marion High School, uh, wrote in and said, I've been reading a little about brown fat and its relationship to hibernation. Do brown bears at Katmai utilize brown fat? And if so, how? And if not, is there a substitute? And, you know, Ben, I don't really know a whole lot about the differences between like brown fat and white fat tissue. But um, in general, there are a couple of different types of fat that we have in our bodies. It seems like brown fat is uh, something that all mammals have. Um, and that's a, it's a specialized type of fat that's um, deposited only in certain areas of the body. Uh, and burning brown fat is a good way to help generate body heat. Um, so some mammals may be utilizing that more often in hibernation than others. While white fat, for instance, is used as a form of energy. And it's found throughout the body, including around our organs and underneath the skin. So we have a, you know, a layer of, of brown fat, or excuse me, or white fat or, uh, underneath our skin. I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information on, um, you know, how bears utilize brown fat versus white fat. But one study that I was able to find is that uh, in polar bears, they found uh, that scientists found that as bears get fatter, um, their fat deposits in the body increased all of them, um, in including the ones around their organs, except for those around the heart. Um, but it was the superficial fat deposits, the fat around um, or just underneath the skin that um, increased uh, faster than all others. Um, and this enlarged superficial layer of adipose tissue, I think, was uh, is primarily an adaptation uh, for increased energy storage. So again, that, that, um, that white fat is really the most important part of a bear's, um, a, a bear's wintertime survival strategy. So Bobby from Lakeside Elementary asked, what is the best part of your job? What do I need to do to get your job? 
And I would say the best part of working as a park ranger, especially in Katmai National Park, is living in a place where your backyard is a postcard. Being surrounded by the natural world, waking up and seeing mountains right out your back door, and then being surrounded by um, phenomenal wildlife like these awesome bears and getting to talk to people about them every single day um, is definitely my favorite part of the job. And to get a job like this, um, first of all, having a passion for the outdoors and for wild animals is a great start. Um, you could go and study animal biology or um, any other degree that would allow you to be learning about the outdoors, how to manage recreational areas. Um, there are so many different positions in national parks too. It's not just park ranger positions that are interpretive like mine. Um, you can do maintenance in national parks. You can go into law enforcement in national parks. You can go into archeology span and studying um, the peoples that lived in national parks for years before um, they became national parks or monuments. So there's so many things that you can do even outside of just talking about um, the animals or the, the places themselves. So whatever you're passionate about, if you truly wanna work in a national park, um, we can figure out a way to get you plugged in. Very well said. Um, uh, lots of great opportunities in national parks. And, and it was great to um, get everyone's questions about brown bears and, uh, and giving us, the Brooklyn and I, the opportunity to learn more about these animals and share some of our experience with everybody. Uh, Brooklyn, thanks so much today for sharing your expertise. Thank you for having me. And my name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org. Please vote in Fat Bear Week this year, which runs September 30th through October 6th. Please uh, join us for other live events on Explore.org that'll be happening throughout the winter and of course next year with Bear Cam next summer. Have a great day, everyone, and never stop learning.